Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Peace and love everybody. Welcome back to the Travelers Podcast. I'm Brother Ali. This last couple months on the podcast has been really dope for me. It's been a really amazing run. And shout out to my incredible producer and partner, BK1. Um, so my wife and I have been together for 20 years. It'll be 20 years this coming fall. And we're converts to Islam. And so it, during the pandemic, we actually made the decision to move to Istanbul, Turkey. So we've been here for about two and a half years. After being Muslim for 30 years, this is my first time really getting to experience Ramadan in a Muslim country. The first year we were here, it was the lockdown. And then the second year, things had opened up again. And so I finally got the chance to earn money again. So I went out on tour. And then this year, it was a big deal. Like we planned for it. I looked forward to it. And so the week leading into Ramadan, we did an episode where I just talked about what my intentions were. And then each of the four weeks during Ramadan, I was reflecting on things that I was experiencing and thinking and feeling. The week after Ramadan for the Eid, the festival, the holiday at the end, we did a sixth episode about Ramadan without guests. And you guys listened all the way through for the most part. The week immediately after that, Atmosphere released a dope new album called So Many Other Realities Exist Simultaneously. This is the album that I had heard a year ago when Slug and I hung out the first time he was on the podcast. And he made this album about the time that led up to us leaving Minneapolis. So we, he came back on, we had a full conversation about that. A really well-received episode. Uh, anytime Slug is around, he just brings this magic with him. And then last week on the podcast, we talked to one of the artists that really inspired me so much and continues to do so, but particularly when Mystic dropped her first album, Cuts for Luck and Scars for Freedom, that album was really, really impactful on me. So she came on the podcast last week and talked us through her journey, and it was really amazing. If you didn't get a chance to hear that episode yet, please go back and check that out. Do not miss that episode. Don't just skip over it. So I've been able to do all these things on the podcast that really mean a lot to me. And these are the different worlds that I really want to bring together. So this episode that you're going to hear today is a first of its kind. We have a group of three young brothers that are extended family and family to us. Uh, it's my wife's cousin, so my cousin by marriage, who's a young black brother from the Bronx. He's actually Afro-Caribbean, so he's Puerto Rican and Panamanian. But my wife's cousin, her baby cousin, like you know how you have that like baby cousin that you just love? That's why I say he's my wife's cousin. He's my cousin too, by marriage, and I love him to death. And he got a bunch of pictures of me. He's a photographer, and he's traveled and seen my shows. And like, that's my man. I love this dude. But I always say he's, he's my wife's cousin because that's like her baby cousin. And when I first met her, she's like, man, I, my baby cousin. And you know, now he's in his 30s, not a baby at all. But he started coming to Minneapolis to visit us around the time of the Soundset Festival that Rhymesayers was throwing. At that same time, one of my dear friends, who is a, another young Black brother entrepreneur who is originally from Queens and now lives in Denver, he started coming as well. And then they would come to town. But my man, Mally, who's toured with us as our support artist a couple times now, Mally is also one of our just deep, dear family friends that just is at our crib. So every year during Soundset, these three guys would just converge on Minneapolis and really just kind of camp out at our house and make fun of me and play with the kids. It was just a really beautiful thing that we started looking forward to. So now Soundset doesn't happen anymore. We're not in Minneapolis anymore, but these three guys remain a unit and they travel together and hang out together. And this year they gave us a tremendous gift by flying halfway around the world to come kick it with us in Istanbul. This is the first time that people have come to Istanbul just to visit us. And it's amazing because this was a huge shift for me and my family. And we're really happy about the life that we're living here, but it's so hard to describe it to other people, especially people that are in America. Shout out Susan Compion, you know what I'm saying, from Giant Steps in Minneapolis. She lived in different countries and she actually gave me some really good advice. And shout out to Yasin Bey, my dear brother, who is one of the people that encouraged me to move my family out of America. It's a really profound journey to be on. You're really in it alone because you're around all of these people from this other culture and you're just weird and new to them. It's such a big transition. And one of the things that I uncovered in therapy 
I never realized the role that validation plays in my life. And, you know, my father was somebody that I had a complicated relationship with. Not long after he died, I went to Mecca to, for the pilgrimage. And I remember thinking to myself, man, my dad would think that this was dope. You know, that was something that I really felt. And I, did, I didn't feel that very often. Like I wasn't looking for his validation, at least not in a way that I knew, but something about me being in Mecca and me being the only person that looked like me in millions of people in Mecca, I was like, my dad would think this was cool and I wish that I could show it to him. And then also when I moved here, both of my parents are gone. You know, they both passed away. And when I moved here, I remember saying to maybe my wife or somebody, this is something that I wish I could tell my parents. Like, yo, I am moving my family to this little neighborhood on the Asian side of Istanbul. Just because I would, I think that they would think that was cool or just like I wanted somebody to see it. You know what I mean? So Mally and, and the two brothers stayed in our neighborhood and I, I spent almost every waking moment with them, taking them around and showing them the different scenes and sights and vibes and neighborhoods and food and customs and culture and just different parts and energies of this really amazing place. And they also got to see us and our family. It was a tremendously validating experience. It was really, really powerful for us because we got to see the last couple years of our lives through somebody else's eyes. We got to see ourselves reflected in our friends. And this is what the travelers thing is about. We're co-travelers. And part of how we assess and understand and contextualize our own journey is by seeing ourselves reflected in other people and other people seeing themselves reflected in us. All of us are trying to be and do the best we possibly can. I just have to say at the beginning that some people probably saw Mally on our tour and are fans of his music and are saying, dope, I finally get to hear the whole story about Mally. I'm sorry, that's not what this is. What you're hearing here are two friends two dear, dear friends that love each other to death and really share and do life together, reflecting on a moment that we're both having. Mally is a Black brother from South Minneapolis who grew up not far from where George Floyd was murdered by the police. And his mother really valued education, so she did everything she could to send him to the best private schools his entire school career. And then after that, he went to college and he worked in corporate. So Mally has this really well-built understanding of how to navigate the white world. And then he came into the underground music scene in Minneapolis, where the fan base is overwhelmingly white, like the listening base is overwhelmingly white. And so they usually choose artists that are also white. Minneapolis really sees itself as this very progressive city, but it's just overwhelmingly white. So whatever white people like is what's going to succeed and excel in Minneapolis. And Mally is one of the artists that's been able to navigate that. You'll hear him talk about it and, and only he can really describe it. But Mally is talking about what it's like to be out of America in Istanbul as a black man outside of America. So we're going to have to do another episode where we give you just the greatness of Mally. This particular episode is two friends talking through a very specific experience that we're having in our lives. We're brought to you as always by the Zakat Foundation. Zakat Foundation is a humanitarian organization that does really dope work all over the world. These are people that I know and love and trust. And so they've been our partners from the beginning. If you go to Zakat US on social media, follow all the work they do. It's a Muslim led organization, but they don't only help Muslims and they don't proselytize. They just do dope work and they partner with the people in the communities that they're helping. It's the real thing. So while you're listening to this, just go to zakat.org and put something on their hurricane relief, their, their earthquake relief, put something on their orphan program, put something on their Ukrainian relief, put something on the Palestinian relief. It's really powerful stuff. Really grateful for you being here. Really hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it with my dear brother, Mali. <laughs> Man, so this is the first time I've ever had somebody in this studio, <laughs> like recording here. I've never, and I've, it's only the third time that I've had an in-person podcast recording at all. Mm. The first one, I did those two with Slug, mm -hmm. and then I did one with Amir Suleiman. We just happened to both be in tennis, Memphis at the same time. Okay. Um, 
but that's it. And then, and then, so this is the first time. And it's just a trip that like, I've been living here for two years or, or like two and a half years or something. Mm -hmm. And I always think about my people from back home. Uh -huh. And so like today, especially, there's been times since we've been here, but especially today, like even just when we were walking from the coffee shop uh -huh. over here, just me and you, yeah. like these are streets that I walk every single day. Wow. And I'm out here completely by myself. I don't know if my family, but like none of my people are here. Yeah, yeah. And and um, you know, it's just not a thing where people come visit like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like such a trip <laughs> having miles you away. here and having Joe here and having Alex here, and mm -hmm. but especially for me and you after being on tour, <laughs> like it we, feels like that. It feels like a day off. It felt like just days off the whole week. I mean, but you do live miles away across the world too, and. Yeah, you can't just like drive to somebody's house. Say, hey, let's go grab lunch, you know? It isn't a, a 15 minute drive anymore. Yeah. You know, how it used to be. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're somebody that used to like just routinely just come to the crib. Yeah. And man, yeah, it's just such a, it's really dope yeah. having you here. And it's making me see everything through, almost through different eyes. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when you guys came in this space the other day mm -hmm. and I was just like, wow, I should really carpet this and I should put things on the walls and I should, you know, there's, there's like a pile of like soundproofing stuff in the corner. Like I should probably figure <laughs> out what I'm doing with that. You know what I mean? Start getting self-conscious. I mean, just realizing, you know, just seeing it through other eyes. I'm like, man, oh yeah. You know, or like some of these hooks on the uh, curtains aren't connected because I was pulling them shut one day and they just came off and I just was like, whatever, I'm, I'm in bed. You know, or like the way they do all the curtains here is like they're all mega long and then you take them to the tailor mm -hmm. and you tell them how many centimeters and they just cut them and hem them, you know. It's just like, man, I should just fully move in. Yeah, it's, it's, it is kind of one of those things. It's different when you, even though you've been here for two, two and a half years, it's almost still, at least to me, some sort of acclimation process, you know. Um and sometimes it, it's it's even though it's not, I'm assuming this is a permanent place. You know, it, there's going to be a permanent place of residence. It's still it's you're still just adjusting to how things move and even how people are. Still probably seeing new places, new faces, and yeah. and all of that. And and it, it's it's different. You're trying to just figure out the, the all of the cuts, man, and 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 how this thing this thing works. And then you know, there's just like you said, not driving the way things flow to the standard operating procedures as far as when it cut when you need something done in paperwork or right. you need somebody to come out and fix something you yeah. got to be patient it's not this instantaneous process how it might be back in the in, as they say the states but and i'm sure that can be like challenging and frustrating it's like yo time is looked at differently um but it's it's beautiful out here yeah what's your i mean we've talked about it a little bit but mm -hmm. What's your overall impression like after after because you've been here for five days? Like what's the what's the what's your main impression? Like what'll be your main takeaways? The man, the one thing that I think is just different is is not once is I think when I first came into Istanbul, you just don't know how people will respond to you as a person of color as yeah. a black person, as a black man. Yeah. Um, and it's like you have all of these, all of these assumptions about what a place might be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, at least for me coming up, just the experiences that I've had growing up um, as a child, teenager, college, post-grad, all of that, you just, you you operate from this place of, especially if it, if it feels like a place where there might be lighter skinned people, assumably, you're like, what are their assumptions or thoughts about like a black American? Um, but just walking around, it didn't feel as if anyone was was rude. Nobody was staring. This is different. That's and the I, thing I wouldn't expect. I, I thought people were gonna stare. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it, it's like there's such a, a homogeneous place. Like there's such a like in Turkey. There's Turks. Yes. They speak Turkish. They eat Turkish food, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like it's very rare. Like we've been to the taco place twice since you've been here because it's a, like a for real, legit spot. Mm -hmm. That's very rare. 
But yeah, that's one of the things that I was, I think I said in the group chat too, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like three black brothers coming here. I'm like, yeah. if people do stare at you, this is why, mm -hmm. this is what they mean and this is what they don't mean. Yeah, yeah. And that didn't, and, and but all even with that, um, even if they were, it didn't feel the same. It, would, it just didn't feel the same as it does back in the United States or in Minneapolis, or if you're in Los Angeles, or if you're in Duluth, or, you know, South Carolina, or something like that. It just feels different. It was more like, it feels safe. Mm -hmm. Like, in safe in the sense of, I can be me, even though people tend to be a little bit more on the quiet side as far as how they talk. Oh, dude. And, you know, you might get shushed, you know, by somebody. Yeah, we got shushed on the. Well, I mean, the thing is like, yeah, that's one of the main things I notice is like, I'm a person that can be very loud and I can also be very quiet. Mm -hmm. And when we moved here, that's one of the main things that we learned right away is just how mm -hmm. loud Americans are. Yes. Like we're just very loud people. Yes. And Turks are very mild with how they do everything. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of meaning and there's a, but I mean, you know, their food is mild and like even mm -hmm. like their beauty, like their art, there's something very subtle. Mm -hmm. It's it's subtle beauty. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like you eat some food and it's delicious, but it's not bussing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and, and there's this term that I would always hear people from other cultures say, they'd be like, oh, this is nice food. Yeah. Or they'd be like, did you taste the tea? It's really nice. Yeah. Like just the idea of food being nice. Yeah, yeah. Like usually for us, man, food got to kick you in the face with yeah. flavor. You know what I'm saying? It's aggressive. Use all these aggressive terms. And yeah. I think there's a mix of hip hop in that too, like the, the hip hop thing. But it's like, it's either it's fire. Right. This was, you know, all the terms that are meant to be, that's just the ill, like, things about that is like it could be some aggressive word like oh this was fire yeah you know yeah this is busting it's just something that's just like when you think of it it's just super like, just why got jarring to... is the word you use a lot of times like, it's just jarring <laughs> yeah it's got to be jarring and violently violently pleasant but man this uh is like they're just they're just very mild mm -hmm. people Yes. And they're very subtle with how they say things and how they do things and how they. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like we're loud. And so I'm just hyper aware of it when my American, when Americans come here, because yes. like in the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm saying people are quiet in the hallways. Mm -hmm. You don't hear people yelling in the hallway. Yeah. And so like today, like, you know, you guys are saying goodbye to my daughters and stuff. And the door was open and I'm just like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> or like when we're out in public, there's times where I'm just aware. But like you said. So we're standing out. Mm -hmm. And then also they can't understand certain things like mm -hmm. we we're in a cab the other day and the dude looks at the at, at you and Al, Alex and Joseph and is like, black, 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 white? <laughs> Whoa, just like, what is this? Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then asking us, where are you from? And we're like, we don't know where we're from. Mm -hmm. He's like, why don't you want to know where you're from? Like, they have no concept of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And even seeing us and how loud we are. And also English. Mm -hmm. is not only not only is it rare but english can be offensive for certain people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the way we're behaving is offensive to people wow but they never mm -hmm. acted in a way that was like there's no karens here right like we got shush so i'm saying when people right. hear that they might be like oh hell no i wish mother would yeah. shush me <laughs> but it's just like they're just like hey mm -hmm. you're being loud and you're not supposed to be like that you yeah. know yeah and they weren't singling us out either because of the fact that it wasn't, it wasn't racially, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it didn't feel, not saying that race isn't real. I forgot the way you described it on a previous talk oh, or conversation. Probably that is uh, science fiction and social reality. Yes. and Somebody and so, said, so I heard somebody say yeah, that. Yeah, so I'm not denying that part of it. Um, but it was definitely more of just the culture of, the space mm -hmm. and every place you go has different house rules right and, and and even you know when you step into not even just the mosque but maybe you step into a person's home or the studio whatever that space may be you take your shoes off right even us as individuals have different house rules of of how we interact and communicate with each other and yeah. and and i think especially when you're not from the space is either you ask 
or maybe just try to read the room right. to see what everyone else is doing. And and I think that there, yeah, it's, there's, but there's still like, a, I respect that. And, and, there, and, and it's partly how I was raised and, and things of that nature, but it just feels like a very safe place, even though the driving style is like Indy 500 sometimes, you know, folks are going 30, 40, 50, but then we, there's no accidents hardly. I didn't see one accident on the road no, or any of that. Yeah. Um, and, and folks are letting people in kindly. The honks, even the honking isn't offensive. It sounds different. It's got a different energy to it. Like how does a, a, the horn on a car have a certain energy, but you can mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. that it's just like, hey, I'm right here. Yeah. It's just like, it's, or you know what I mean? Or it's mm -hmm. like, hey, you're getting a little far away. It's like there's something about it that feels like polite, yeah. It yeah. feels caring. I'm willing to bet a few lira, <laughs> Turk, some Turkish lira, that nobody cursed at me or cursed it like, oh, oh, walking in the street. Da, 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 da. But in the States, it people are ready to get out of the car right. and fight and sometimes go take it to the furthest extreme because you may have walked in front of their car or maybe you cut them off in traffic or you or cut them off in line or yeah. you looking at me too. It's just a whole different place. Man, I try to explain to people or, or just like try to convey this feeling of like, especially with mass shootings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like we have mass shootings and so people have different feelings about like policy wise, mm -hmm. like what should be the policy that's gonna solve that problem? Mm -hmm. And then we got a whole argument around that policy. Mm -hmm. So there's people that are like, we gotta get rid of guns or we gotta get rid of certain guns or we gotta, cause the guns are doing this. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm, this is not a comment on what the, the policy might be. Mm -hmm. And then other people that are like, no, we have to have guns because people have to be able to protect themselves mm -hmm. from each other and from criminals and from the government and from whatever. Not really a comment on either one of those. Yeah. But the thing is that Turks all have guns because they've all been in them. All the men have almost have been in the military, mm -hmm. unless you're super connected or rich or, or something and you can get out of it. But they've almost all been in the military. Mm -hmm. And gun violence is almost zero. Mm -hmm. But they all have guns. And it's not that they don't have deep, serious issues that they disagree about. Like they disagree about uh, foreigners coming in, you know, uh, you know, they disagree about uh, immigration. They disagree about the economy. They disagree about religious people and secular people, like how the country should be led, how the money should be, you know, allocated. All this stuff, and it's serious. And like they're going through a major economic crisis. Mm. Even in this time, like people are together. There's a feeling of joy and love and togetherness everywhere you go. There's people sitting, drinking tea together eating together, yeah. smiling, walking, holding hands. Yeah. There's children running everywhere. There's cats and dogs roaming freely. Kids are chasing birds and <laughs> people are living, like really living life, even with this thing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is nobody wants to kill each other. Right. Like nobody wow. has the desire to shoot a bunch of strangers. Man. And that's the part that for me as, as an artist, I'm like, I understand, okay, maybe policies might help that. Mm -hmm. but they don't like why do we have the desire to murder each other in mm -hmm. such a uh, like alarming numbers mm -hmm. and what can be done about that yeah you know and to me that's the most interesting part man i don't even have a response just even hearing you mm -hmm. process that out loud or, or speak to that out loud especially the part of not having the desire to to kill one another like there's been moments during this this time of when I've been having conversations with, with whether it's you and I or, you know, me and Alex or me and Joseph, I, I have to like pace myself when I'm talking because if I start getting really mm -hmm. excited, you know, I might cry or, you know, because even when I was saying like, yeah, this place isn't, it's not perfect in the sense of every, you know, but something about it just, the fact that people can bump into each other and, in the market or in the bazaar, at the spice market, or buying food on the road, it's hectic, but it but it isn't. Right. It it's it it just naturally feels like it's a there's a lot of people in a space. Yeah. And and it, and it's almost to the point where 
but it's not disrespectful. It's not from this place of I'm going to get over on you or mm -hmm. before you, I'm going to get over on you before you get me. And I feel as if I didn't once have to feel like I'm watching mm -hmm. or watching my back or mm -hmm. somebody's going to try to st snatch my bag or not any of that. Yeah. Not even just killing people, but I never felt like anybody was just out to get at me or us. Dude, my, one day all. one day we went out for a whole day. Like our whole family went. We took the we took the ferry to the European side. Mm -hmm. We spent the whole day. We left at like 10 a.m. and we came back at like after midnight. Yeah. Like we're carrying the little the babies through the door cuz they're asleep. Mm -hmm. And somehow in the hustle and bustle of leaving, the door to our apartment got left wide open. Mm. And we just knew nobody touched anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And again, major economic downturn. We got three MacBook Pros in the house. We got phones. We got, uh, you know, the, like the equipment that I brought. So there's like, there's, a, you know, an expensive camera in there and there's TV and, you know, my daughter's Xbox and all this stuff. We just knew that nobody, nobody probably even looked in our house. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And like, we did a walkthrough. <laughs> but it was like, me and my wife were just kind of like, yo, like, it's just kind of like, man, growing up in this culture, I don't know if our kids are going to be as streetwise as we are, mm -hmm. but also the fact that there's just not that need to do it. Man, when you're talking about people bumping into each other, there's this feeling that I have in America that, like, you don't realize the feelings you're having until you don't have them. But, being in America, or like when I'm here, I realize like people don't see other human beings as impediments mm -hmm. and as a disease mm -hmm. and as something to be hateful of and something to be defensive against and something to fight against. Mm -hmm. Like a person is not uh, is not your enemy. Mm -hmm. Just that's not the default. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a bunch of people. We're all sharing the space. Mm -hmm. We're sharing the ferry. We're sharing the train. We're sharing the the street. We're sharing the mosque, the market. We're going to share the graveyard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think over here, even though everybody may not be rich or balling out of control, people are just genuine. To me, some of the most like, friendliest people. Yeah. Especially when you go to a spot, a restaurant, a coffee shop. People aren't rushing you. Even though, it's, once again, it's busy. Yeah. But people aren't rushing you. Right. You get in there and you're just... You don't get that, but as they, you know, back at the, I don't get that. But it's not like that back at the house. You know, yeah. as soon as you order the food, they're trying to get you out of there before you're even done eating. Right. They're like, oh, do I, can I put this in a box for you? Like, yo, there's food on a plate still. I'm not even done yet. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a feeling of like belonging. Mm -hmm. Like everybody just knows that they belong in the world. Mm -hmm. They belong in this country mm -hmm. and essentially belong to each other. Mm -hmm. And even us, who we don't actually belong. Yes. There, it, it's not questioned. It's not like, well, wait, you're not Turkish. Mm -hmm. You don't speak the language. Like, we don't even speak their language. You know what I mean? Like, we can't really even speak to them. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we could do if they decided to mistreat us. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, you walk in a place and it's just understood. Like, okay, you're a person. You're mm -hmm. standing here in front of me. I don't know anything about you doesn't matter. It doesn't matter like what I may or may not know or assume about you. Mm -hmm. You're a human being, so you're supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and nobody is rushing you out. And, and I'm trying to think like when you say something like that to someone mm -hmm. that's only been in America and never experienced a really like traditional culture. Because mm -hmm. if you go to Sweden, you might not feel that. No diss mm -hmm. to Europe. But like... Northwestern Europe is pretty much, it's a lot like America in a lot mm. of ways. Okay. You start coming to like the Middle East and Asia and even like Eastern Europe and Africa and, you know, certain, like when you get away from what? The first world, the white world, mm. the European world, the Christian world, I don't know. Yeah. When you get away from that dominant world sent view yes. and get among people who it's like our culture our traditions, what we believe, even through our differences, has held us together. Yes. Like, man, something that, that stuff sounds little. Like you said, like if you say to somebody, they don't rush you out of a restaurant. Mm -hmm. They don't ask you, like if you sit down, nobody's like, hey, are you going to buy something? 
You know what I mean? Like you just always, it's, ta- it's, it's taken for granted that you belong to humanity. Yes. Yes. And they show it especially with children, with elders, mm-hmm. with people who seem like they need help, mm. with animals. That's everything. Like, once again, just hearing you say that, that's like a, that to me is like so divine and, and, and it's, it's, it, there's a purity to that. Yeah. That's how we should be moving. Right. With, with practicing uh, Buddhism and meditation and mindfulness, like everybody experiences greed, anger, delusion, indifference, sloth, whatever, you know, all of those different d- desire, uh, withdraw. We experience those things. And then it, and the one thing that I've learned is is through practice is if I'm experiencing these things as a human being, mm-hmm. I'm not the only one experiencing these things. Mm-hmm. So it puts you in this place of, I know that this person, if I cross paths with them, I don't know what they're what they've been experiencing throughout the day, but I know that they've probably experienced yeah. one one or maybe all of these things yes. in a day or all in this week. All these ingredients are at play in some fa- yeah. form or fashion. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that also in America, especially in the black community, name brand clothes, just just appearance. Yes, yes, appearance is 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 important. I think you should present yourself yeah. as best you can. Yeah. But being over here, everybody's wearing uh they're wearing a, a Nike shoe, but you're like, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, if this person wore this shoe at, to school. Everybody's gonna roast them. They get clown because yeah, there's a lot of replicas or knockoffs. Or yes, whatever you yes, call them. yes. Yeah. And I just think about nobody's clowning, Instagramming. What are those? Or right. we're not bringing that. And 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 like all of that is, it's not even a thing. It just it really, really, really once again makes you check in with yourself about it. It reminds you of all of the things that yeah. are are fleeting. They're impermanent. They're not yeah. real. These things that we place so much value in Mm -hmm. um it's almost as if those things are pushed to the side and it's like are you being gentle with people are you being are you saying thank you to people yeah i've heard thank you so many times since i've been here and everybody's an individual in the united states it's all based around individualism me 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 mine my mind yeah i'm gonna get mine right um if i have this on or that on, mm-hmm. that's where, that's the point system for me. That's my social currency. Mm-hmm. That's my point system. If I don't have these things on, mm-hmm. I'm I'm less than, I'm not worthy. If yeah. I don't have this, I don't do this. People are judging me and sizing me up based on that. Yeah. You know, versus here, it's not, oh, where do you work? Where do you live? Uh, where'd you get those from? Right. Uh, you know, how much money do you have in the, nah, like, can I just, can I just be? Yeah. That's the one thing that I've always just really, truly, truly just as for me is like being able to just be, mm-hmm. just really be. Um, and and that's that's challenging. Cause once again, when you're ra- like for me, my experience is is was primarily private school, mm-hmm. constantly being picked apart. Right. How you right, talk, yeah, yeah. what you wear. I can only imagine. How you respond to things. Yeah. Not being able to you know, being able to <laughs> express or, or have multiple ways as a child? How do you express your anger? I mean, all of that stuff. Because, you, you know, you see, like, people are presentable. Yes. You know what I mean? Even though you could tell, you you don't really know who has money and who doesn't. Right. It kind of feels like everybody's at a similar level. Yes. Where, like, everybody looks like their clothes are clean. Mm-hmm. Everybody looks like they got somewhere to sleep. And you don't see any homeless people. Right. You know what I mean? Like very rarely you might see somebody sleep on a bench or something like that, but it's so rare. Everybody looks like they slept somewhere. Everybody looks like they ate something. Everybody looks like if they got sick, they'd be able to do something about it. You know what I'm saying? Like the that thing is all there. And there is some variation in how people present themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a, okay, this person has more of a like hip hop aesthetic then and especially like with religious people yes you know what i mean the religious people is like okay the women dress like this the men and like that and it's a similar kind of vibe like they all wear really uh lo- loose fitting 
kind of flowy clothing. Yes. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, there's no feeling that like my clothes are going to determine what my status mm. in the society is. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, I, I felt like there were a lot of clothes that I had at home that I would feel silly wearing here. Mm. Like things that, like the ways that I would dress sometimes back in Minneapolis or in America, mm -hmm. I would just feel so ridiculous dressing like that. Yeah. And the thing that, the thing that when, when we did our last tour together, yes. that, I, that I was trying to put together, what does this, all this mean? And it felt to me again, like in, in America, you don't automatic, your default is that you are a cancer mm. just by being a person who's not a VIP. Mm. So like you got to be rich or you got to be famous. Mm. And that's how you, those are the only people that deserve to exist. Wow. Because we can use you in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali, the Sudanese brother. Yes. He said, you know, I just want to be a human being. I don't want to be human resources. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Man. Oh, and he's bars for days. All day. So the thing is, like, if you're rich, I, I can get some money from you. Mm -hmm. If you're famous, I might be able to get some fame from you. Yes. If you're powerful, you might be able to do something for me. Mm -hmm. If you're sexy, then I can objectify you and mm -hmm. use you for sex. Right. But if you're not any of those things, then you're actually, I would, it would be better to all of society if you would just die. Man. And so that's so you have to be one of those things, and none of those things can be achieved. Or I mean, you know, most of those things, the way you achieve them is by outstripping and defeating other people. Mm -hmm. So it's just a society constantly at war with itself. Yes, to even exist, like you, you have to, you got to prove that you deserve to exist. Mm. That's wild. Whereas in a natural community that knows culture, that has shared history, that's got a shared religion. Mm -hmm. It's understood that like off top, the baseline is like everybody deserves to eat. Everybody deserves to be treated like a human being. Everybody belongs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You said a, a lot of, a, a lot of stuff that just resonates with where I'm at currently. We might connect it to it, attribute to certain things, but it all comes down to me at least that love is or the, the feeling of, of the belonging, love or the belonging piece, mm -hmm. Whatever, whichever one you want to interchange that with. But right. the, either it's the belonging, but then the belonging comes down to the feeling of love. Yeah. Money, oh, because I, I want to be famous or I want to have this. It's not even a fact of I don't want to work anymore. I want to be this. Or I, want, like, right. I want to be able to, if, I, if I'm able to buy these things, right. if I'm able to do these things for somebody, they might love me yes, or, the, or, right. or, or they'll feel loved. Yeah, yeah. It's, we're always trying to give and get whatever that, that thing is that we call, that we call love. And yeah. then we end up seeing people do certain yes. things out of character yeah. or trying to figure out, man, if I do all these TikTok videos, cause nobody's paying attention to my song. Right. Then they'll, they'll pay attention to me then. Right. And then it's still at the base of it. It's, whether it's, and it's, to me, it's on a spectrum. It's like, you've got some of the, the you know, attention or a like, or, mm -hmm. and then there's just that unconditional, but it all, for me at least, comes back to the idea of love. Yeah, and that, and that, and that it's a transaction. <laughs> when that's really the opposite of what it is. Yes. And one of the things I notice about being a religious person here versus being a religious person in America mm -hmm. is like that idea that love is... The, just the 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 false notion, the the misguided idea that love is to have succeeded in a transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. well, then it's the opposite of that. Like love just is. Yeah. And we translate that, or I've I've experienced a lot of people carrying that right over into religion and spirituality and mm -hmm. all this stuff, where it's like, I need to do these things so that God will love me. <sighs> The, the idea that that's what a, a tradition is. And yes, in Islam, there's five prayers and there's mm -hmm. halal and haram and there's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There, there's all of this stuff that mm -hmm. is part of the, the thing. But the idea that even in religion, like I will become successful when I've done all of the things that will earn the love of the creator. Mm -hmm. That is such a broken concept of what religion is, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in, in living in a place that like these people have been Muslim for 600 years and they've gone through a lot. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's all kind of people that when I go and pray in the mosques, mm-hmm. there's always a community of people praying in the mosque. And there's always people in there mm-hmm. that look like they're on their way to the club or just came from the club mm-hmm. or they got the, the haircut or the tattoos or the clothes that indicate this is not an outwardly religious person that's playing the part. Mm-hmm. They're in here connecting with Allah in this moment. Yes, sir. And even in that situation, nobody thinks they shouldn't be there. Even like y'all coming into the mosque, like people who aren't Muslim mm-hmm. coming into the mosque with cameras, taking pictures, kids running around. Yeah. Uh, you know, people in there having picnics inside a a, a six hundred year old mosque. Mm-hmm. It's understood that also just like how we naturally all are just love is is who we are Mm -hmm. but also we all are relating to allah we're all relating to the creator Mm -hmm. because that's what that's what we were created for yes it's not something that needs to be earned Mm -hmm. the baseline is everybody belongs here man yeah so okay so religious wise so like you know we've been roommates on tour Mm-hmm. So there are certain Muslim teachers that would come to town that love you and you would drive them and stuff. And yes, so it's like you've been around us. Yes, sir. But you this is your first time in a Muslim country. Yes, sir. What's it what's it like to hear the call to prayer? What's it like to see graves everywhere? What's it like to see men in turbans and women with their face covered? And what's it like being in this Muslim country? It doesn't make me uncomfortable. It is something that it's so it it's just to keep it simple, it's it's a way of life. It, it's the it's the practice. It's the it's the culture, and it it's it doesn't make me uncomfortable, or I'm not. It's not like I'm at a at a zoo. Ooh, that you know, I'm not. It doesn't make me feel. It's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful, and it, it's it's like oh, these folks are living, mm-hmm. and I really and I love it because folks hug, right? All of that. That's yeah, men be- hug like, each other. Men hold hands. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Like that is, and people are just great. And once again, they greet you, they look you in the eye when they talk, they say thank you. Even in the spaces that were uh, more secular, mm-hmm. when we went across town and hung out, okay. Even then, um, there was still just a peace. Yeah, it just felt peaceful. Because you know everybody has their, their their assumptions about things. Never once did it seem, oh man, like. It's oppressive here, and mm-hmm. people aren't aren't living, and people are interacting amongst each other. Men, women, folks are talking, folks are conversing. Yeah, a lot of smiles. Yeah, a lot of laughs. Yeah, even the people. There's just still like a level of respect. There's just a level of respect and a level of love that I haven't felt. Yeah, in the United States, dude. And I mean, there's a big election coming up. Like that's one of the other things that's happening in this moment. Yes that y'all are here for and it's like i don't even know how to explain it because it there's an enormous presidential election coming up yes and the religious president who's been the president for the last uh, you know decade Mm -hmm. or been like a a big player for the last decade he's very controversial Mm -hmm. and this country is really divided Mm -hmm. like it's not certain who's going to win this election Mm -hmm. so it's basically him and then you got six parties in a coalition against him. Wow. So like everywhere we go, there's, you see his picture up everywhere and you see all this like stuff advertising for the opposition party. Like all of those people driving around playing stuff on speakers. Those are like very politicized messages, the music, the people with the flags, the, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But even the energy around that, it's like, man, imagine in public space, where half the people is it would be like it would be like Trump and Bernie Sanders people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sharing space where somebody is blasting a Trump message over <laughs> right. a speaker oh, and man. then somebody else is blasting a Bernie Sanders message on a speaker and everybody's walking around doing their thing eating food mm-hmm. go, getting on the train like there's nobody's even like with the most divisive messages that really way on people's everyday reality are like public we're sharing spaces with those campaigns and there's nobody is in each other's face no violence there there's no even like nobody's yelling you don't i didn't even see anybody arguing 
nowadays people barely even trick or treat. And I know like that's like a, a no, super American yeah, yeah. holiday. But even that, yeah. when I was the age of eight, nine, ten years old, mm -hmm. we used to trick or treat for hours. Yeah. Bunches of people, yeah. big bags of candy. You hardly see that. Yeah. Because children, people, adults are hardly even safe. You know, you can't even walk down the street right. for late at night without having to worry. If you pull your phone out, if that light, if that light goes off walking yeah. down a certain street, somebody might take it, could potentially take advantage of you. That's not the that's not always, but that can happen. Here, yeah. children are safe. Ch I mean, there, I saw two young Young girls probably had to be eight or nine yeah. years old, just walking down the street with bags in their hand, yeah. like they coming from you know Saks Fifth, right. just like ball, like balling. It's like Dude, you wouldn't see that those, downtown those two Minneapolis. Little, like seven year old girls that we got on the bus and we're riding again. <laughs> like we're that's a busy neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's a that is a bustling. Like we were in on the European side, yes sir. And those two little like seven year old girls are on the bus. And we were all holding on because the bus is doing these crazy turns and we're like trying not to fall down. They weren't holding anything. They got wow. sea legs. Like their bus <laughs> legs were mighty. And they're, they're just like trading candy and being kids. So we're, I'm standing right near the back door of the bus and the girls are trying to get off. And I was trying to figure out how to get out of their way and navigate the door opening and stuff. And one of those eight-year-old girls just looked me dead in the face and just did this hand gesture that's just like, what are you doing? Move. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But even that, there was something so like, the fact that this little seven-year-old, eight-year-old girl looked up at me, this like six foot, 250 pound <laughs> dude who's clearly not from here, yeah. and just did this hand gesture like, move, yeah. out of the way. I'm yeah. trying to get off the bus. Yeah. There's something like, there's something so familiar in the sense that like, it's almost like I'm her uncle. Yes. And you know what I mean? Like she just knew I would never hurt her. Mm -hmm. She it never entered her mind. Right. I would yell at her, I would hurt her, I would mm -hmm. cause problems for her that she would have any trouble. Yes. It's just like I have full sovereignty and right. Yes. If somebody is not moving out of the way, mm -hmm. then this you don't you know how to ride the bus? What are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm really blessed to be able to host conversations like this. And it really shows that just like me and Mally, like our relationship is based on music. We started first connecting through music, but that music, it turns out, is a vehicle that allows us to express things that we weren't able to express in other ways. And, to, and it's a, really a means by which we find each other. But the reason that his music speaks to me, mine speaks to him, the reason that our you know listeners get along so well together, the reason that the people that listen to me appreciate him, vice versa, is because of the fact that it turns out music is really an opportunity for us to express and explore what's going on inside of us. And we really need that. We really benefit from it because we're people of intention. We're people who see ourselves as we are, but we also want to be people of consequence, of good consequences. We want to be good. We want to do good. We want to support good things because we see the world for what it is. And we also want to contribute to making it the best experience that we can for us all. We believe in virtue. We believe in right and wrong. We believe in light and darkness. We believe in the human being. We don't believe that the human being is the worst of what we are. And we don't believe that that's just something that we have to accept the way it is. But we believe that the human being should be celebrated and we should be looking at each other based on the common good between us and really investing in that and, and promoting that and building in that. And so that's what this has always been about for us. And we started in the realm of music and it continues on into, you know, past our 20s when we all found each other. You know what I'm saying? It's not just that this is underground rap music that you got to be in a sweaty club in a little town or in, you know, some like scary section of the Bronx or, or you know, that this really, what brought us all together 
is something that only deepens with time. And so for us, that's what the caravan is about. This caravan that we've been talking about is our real attempt at carrying out the music and the message and the movement, the community, the communication, the bonds between us, what we're sharing and what we're building in our lives is, you know, continuing on. And that's what the, the caravan is really about for us. And so if you go to brotherali.com, you'll be, you'll see a section where you can sign a mailing list. Please do that. But really, if you haven't done it yet, go to that section. It's still continuing to be built. So depending on when you hear this, you'll go there and you'll see there are uh, rare and hard to find collections of my music. So like my 1999, 2000 demo tape called Rites of Passage. That's what I brought to Rhyme Sayers to start this whole journey. So you'll, you'll be able to get, and that's not on streaming services. There was only a thousand copies of the cassette pressed up. So a few people have it. Sage Francis just sent me his, a, a photo of his copy. My man, Chris Jeffords out in the Bay has one of the early copies. I know there are people that have those early copies. And then we did a run of them on CD, a really limited run. And we did another run of limited cassettes. But there's only a very limited number of those in the world. And it's not on streaming services. Because I don't want somebody to say, oh, I like Brother Ali music. Like, let me go check that out and hear it out of context. Some things really, really you require the context. You know what I'm saying? And that's not my first album. That's a demo tape. So if you go to the join section, the caravan section, you'll be able to stream that. That's the first and only place where you can do that. And then you can also hear the, uh, the oral history of making that project where I turn the mic on and talk you through what every part of that early part of my career was like, the connections and the intentions and how it all came together. That's, you just can't get that anywhere else. That's an exclusive. So there's rare stuff, there's hard to find things, and then there's exclusive stuff. Uh, you're gonna see the video from me and Evidence performing at First Half, which is my last time selling out First Half. Maybe I'll do it again, I don't know. But me and Evidence made a project together that people didn't even know was coming. And then the day that it was available, we also had a show at First Ave and we performed that song together that we have on that project. It's called, the, the project is Secrets and Escapes and the song is called Red and it's me and Evidence performing. You can't see that anywhere. It's not available anywhere. Uh, you'll also see me speaking in West Africa about how hip hop led me to Islam and Islam led me back to West Africa and talking to the those, these like West African Muslim elders about what hip hop really means to us and what it's really done for us. It's a major moment in my life. It's not for everybody. I don't want to see a bunch of comments of people who don't even really know or understand what I'm about. I don't want to just put that out into the world, even though I can monetize it. And if people come at me or argue about it, then that'll just drive the numbers up and I'll be able to monetize that. But I don't, that's not how I'm trying to get down. That's not what I'm building and what we're building here together. So there's all these examples of stuff that you can see and hear and experience and be part of if you head to brotherali.com, sign the mailing list, join that caravan for only five bucks a month. I'm trying to get to the point where we have a minimum, like a bare base of 1,000 people. I got 500,000 people following me across platforms on social media. There's 3,000 people that listen to this podcast every week. And then if we have somebody that also has a big platform on, Pharaoh Monch, Slug, uh, Young Guru, Jay-Z's producer and engineer, you know, the numbers spike up during those episodes. But when I have somebody like Mystic that we had last week, you know, a, a woman, an educator, those numbers might not spike. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to have to think about who spikes the numbers and who doesn't. I want to talk to Mystic because what she has to offer us is profound and amazing and incredible and it's beautiful. And I need it. And I want to share it with you because I know there are people out there that need it as well. And the same is true with Dr. Ebony. The same is true with Kiese Lehman or Shane Atkinson. There's people that don't have enormous platforms. And I don't want to have to limit the conversations to only people with big platforms, even though I could do that. I could. All my friends, a lot of my music friends, they also have big platforms. So I could stick to just, you know, doing Ari the Rugged Man and Pharaoh Monch and Chuck D and Cornell West and Ilhan Omar. All those people are famous people that have big platforms. And every time we talk to them, they bring their platform with them. So I could just do that, but I don't want to. 
I don't want to have to only speak to people that have a big platform that'll give me a spike in numbers. I want to talk to the people that have a lot to offer. Like this conversation we're having with Mally, you can't quantify it. So it's like if one person hears it and they're they're inspired to heal and seek wholeness outside of constructs that they've always known about. If somebody gets a spark of an idea that brings about healing for them and for their children and maybe for their parents, I don't need 12 or 15 or 30,000 of people to feel that way. Like if one person is inspired, that's what this work has always been about for me and for us. And so I'm asking you, you know, even if that content doesn't necessarily speak to you, this message and this thing that we're trying to build, this movement, is something that we need your support to be able to do it this way. You know, we could gain your support. We could gain somebody's support by arguing on social media, by, you know, uh, serving up tea. It's not that I don't know stories uh, that would be controversial. It's not that I don't know any gossip. It's not that I don't have controversial takes and opinions on things. It's not that my friends won't do that. Those are the things that drive other podcasts and that drive social media engagement. I just don't want to play that game. That's not how I'm trying to live my life. I'm going in one of these graves someday. And when I'm in that hole, I want to be able to know that I did what I could to promote goodness between people because that's what I need help with. I need help in trying to be a good person. And so I want to connect with people that help me be the best version of me and encourage me and inspire me and help heal me so that I can provide that to myself, to my family, to the world. Ultimately, between me and the creator, that's how I want to honor the creator. And that's what I want to be able to provide others with. So I'm asking you, you know, we're not just going for social media stuff. We're not just going for corporate stuff and not even trying to deliver numbers to our beautiful sponsors that we appreciate and are grateful for. And we're happy to be rocking with. Like we're proud of our sponsors, but I don't want to only have to play the numbers game with sponsors. I want to be able to have the conversations that matter to me and have the ones that matter to you. And in order to do that, in order to go around around all of that, I'm asking you to, to get down with this caravan. We're trying to get to at least 1,000 monthly subscribers at $5, which gives me and BK1 the good reason to be able to take time away from other things and still be able to support our families with the time that we put into this podcast and into this work. Much love to you all. Thank you. Back to this episode. I always think about, you know, James Baldwin coming here. Mm. And everybody talks about that James Baldwin was in Paris. Mm -hmm. And he was. He spent a lot of time. But he came in back and forth between Paris and Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And he said that, like, he was like as a black gay and James Baldwin would say him like part of his, one of his identity markers that the way that he identified was ugly, mm. which is strange to me. <laughs> Cause I, you know what I mean? Cause mm. we all feel like he's beautiful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know what he means? Yes. Though? Like growing up with nobody knowing who James Baldwin is yes. just being in Harlem. He's like, I'm small, I'm frail, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm poor, I'm ugly. Mm. He said that when he came to Istanbul, mm -hmm. he was he could just be like exactly what you're saying. He's like, I was left alone. Mm. I was minding my business. I, it was never a question whether or not I was a person. Mm -hmm. He lived here off and on for 10 years. Mm. And he said there was one time where somebody was bothering him because he was gay. <laughs> but he's like, I, but that was it. That was like a one time. That was like the exception that proved the rule. One time in ten in ten years of going back and forth. Yeah. One time. Yeah. The fact that you can just pick that one time, and then the rest of it, you know, it's just regular. You know, that's I. I'm jealous of that. I envy that. Mm. <laughs> that is, uh, cause I mean, yeah. That that's <sighs> man. I I I don't. It's, I don't know. It's it's hard to even process that. What do you think about the idea that like I I'm raising not white children outside of that? My wife is a black woman, grew up in the Bronx and mm -hmm. Florida, mm -hmm. so like she's already <laughs> it's all you know what I mean. Yeah. And then whatever I am and whatever I and then my kids, the older ones, mm -hmm. they were 
you know, my son is very like visibly black. We, yes. You said that's true. Like you, yes. when, when the world sees him, they see yes. a black man. Yes, yes, yes. My eldest daughter is clearly not white, but you're not quite sure. Yes. And the same thing with the two little daughters. Yes. But they're not white. Right. Like they will never be white in America. So right. I'm like raising these like white, mus- non-white mm-hmm. Muslim women right. who I want them to be connected to our people. Yes. But also the these these realities in America are like foreign to them. Mm -hmm. Like the two little ones, like they will have no concept of this stuff. Right. You know what I mean? And you know them and you know our family and like, you know what I mean? Yes. There's part of me that's like, feels like I should prepare them for that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also kind of like, why? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Why? Like there's like, I, I love, especially the two little, the difference between the two little ones Mm -hmm. that have never experienced all of this lovelessness Mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Yes, sir. They think the world loves them. Mm. They, and and like, they think that the world is just like a beautiful place where people live life. Mm -hmm. They have no idea that the world is racist, that the world would molest people and kill people. And like, they don't even know that that's a thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And like I, but I do wonder sometimes, like, man, is there something that I should be doing to prepare them for that? Um, and I, I don't even know like what the question is, but I guess I'm just like saying yeah. to you as somebody who knows us, yes. who knows America, yes. who's experienced this place even for five days. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Um, I guess I'm just sharing and seeing if you have any reflection on, on that. I don't, that's a hard one because I don't know if there's any, we shouldn't even have to do that. We shouldn't have to tell our kids, hey, make sure when you're driving, you got your seatbelt on, you got Keep your, your driver's ID. license stuck inside your. Yeah, like available and ready. Yeah. Because that's not even about other cars. No. It's not about even dr- like driving safety. No. It's about safety from police and police brutality and you know being uh racially profiled it's not even about like the seatbelt is more for again non-vehicle related things like isn't that crazy yeah um or all of that yeah and we shouldn't even have to tell young people these things to prepare them for the 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 world or the country in which we live in or the places that we we are to, just in order to survive. Yeah. Make sure when you go into this space, you're not talking loud. You know that you dress this way. Yeah. You're essentially watering down everything just to assimilate, just to get by, so people aren't, mm-hmm. you know, picking you out of a crowd or um, potentially trying to box you in. Mm-hmm. And I, I've seen the things that it can do to people yeah. based on the texture of your hair, color of your skin, how you talk, the school, I mean, all of that stuff. You're getting picked apart from day one. Mm-hmm. And, I've, and over here, it's, it's not even a thing. It, it really, it, it, it's, and once again, I've only been here for five days, but it will be a totally different experience. You know, you'd be, you're being met with so much stuff, not even just uh, the presentation of, 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 or, of race and, and skin tone, but then even just at such a young age, gender. I mean, all of that stuff, like everything right. is getting introduced to you yeah. at such a young age. And it's, it's no five-year-old <laughs> know what to do with that. Yeah. You don't know, ten year old or fourteen yeah. re- really know. It's like you haven't even lived really yet. Like you're just you're preparing for yeah. those next steps in life. Yeah, it's like I just want to be a, a child. I just want to be a kid. I just want to be able to read books with the uncles and you know eat lunch with them and laugh and joke. And I don't want to have to think about all of these complex, yeah. challenging things. I'm yeah. I'm five. I'm six. I'm seven. I'm eight. I'm nine. Even when you hit legal adult age, I don't, it, it's wild. Like, and just the amount of stress, anxiety, and worry that can put on a person. Yeah. Especially if you can be in several boxes or or people can put you in several boxes. I don't know what the right, if there's even a, 
yeah. a converse like how you know in in if uh one is even even for yourself if one is uh albino of uh european descent parent like that that's that's complex and then even your children like if they're trying to process like this is my pops yeah how do i digest this conversation with my pops like how do i work around yeah like that yeah you know or with a, a son that is black identifying not only for himself, but just the world in general. Yeah. Like, how do I have this conversation with my my son? Or how does my son, how is he digesting this conversation? Or how is he navigating the way? That's, that's a, that's, I don't know, to be honest, but I just can see the, the complexities in that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's such a like, so I, I struggle with like, so with the older ones, I felt like I didn't have a choice. Mm. Like they needed to know yeah. how the world was going to see them. Yes, sir. And the fact that, and where they are in the power dynamic, mm -hmm. in like the hierarchy of power, the false yeah. hierarchy of power. Yes. Like the socially constructed hierarchy. Yes. Because there's natural hierarchies that are based on. Yes. Not everybody has the same. Not everybody brings the same things to the table. Yes, sir. So in certain circumstances. Yeah. Some people are going to be the leaders, and other people are going to be, you know, serve. serve. Yeah. And then, other, in the, and then another, you know, then you come over here and do this thing. Yeah. Now this person has this role, and this person is this one, and this. But it's based on who you naturally are. It's not yes. based on something, you know, yes. constructed and enforced on you. So, like my older children needed to know that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I just saw how they, and they're still doing it, but like figuring out how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. For my elder daughter, figuring out well, what is it? you know like you said like you know the little ones are all about sparkly <laughs> earrings and you know what i mean they want to show you all their jewelry and they want to you know pink on pink on pink my <laughs> eldest da daughter is not like that at all and so society like society is telling her you must be this and you must be that and you must be this and forcing her to like identify yes you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're like, I don't, I, that wasn't something in her mind. Yes. But it's like, well, we got to figure out how much, we got to figure out how to treat you, mm -hmm. whose team you're on, mm -hmm. who you're aligned with, where you're at in all of these fights. Yeah. You have to wear a jersey in each one of these fights. <laughs> and if you don't, then you're a traitor. Mm -hmm. If you don't suit up, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Then mm -hmm. you're a traitor. And like you said, like with my stuff, it's like, Okay, like I'm still at 45 trying to figure out mm. what all this stuff means for me. Mm. But in society, I am a liar. I'm a traitor. Mm -hmm. I am a all of these things just because I'm trying to figure out what yeah. is what does it mean, you yeah. know? Yeah. And then I got, but then these two little ones, it's like I kind of can't bring myself to tell them that there there's another place. Mm. where people have all think all these things about you yeah. and you're not even aware of it yeah. but it might mean that somebody kills you it might mean that somebody like if somebody sexually violates you they'd probably get away with it mm -hmm. uh if you know what i'm saying you it might be harder for you to go to school get a job you'd have to be better than everybody mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yep there's certain people that if you marry them then you're either a tra like there's all these things about this, all of this stuff. And the fact that they don't even know about it, there's part of me that's just like, man, we'll see if you ever need to know this stuff. It's sick. The world is sick. Parts of the world and is, is, very, is very sick. And, and being around them or other uh, young children who are just, again, they're just at the purest. Yeah. You know, before they figure out Santa Claus isn't real yeah. or that, for those that might be listening, sorry to like you know, the spoiler. Listening with your kids, <laughs> right? Right. Spoiler alert: um, that the that this that this thing, <sighs> like here, man. So my daughter is a Muslim girl who has worn a hijab from the time she was really mm -hmm. young because mm -hmm. my wife wears it, mm -hmm. and the Somali girls at her at school mm -hmm. they all wear it young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's like, oh, if I'm, a, if I'm a Muslim girl, I wear hijab. Never had a conversation with her or my wife about it. Mm -hmm. So in this here, she's a she's also tall. She looks like a grown woman and she's not. Mm -hmm. But but women are just treated with a certain type of, they're given space. Yes. 
Like, it's just like, you don't bother women. You don't touch them. Yes. You don't assume that you're going to have physical access to them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They don't have to go to the mosque, but if they do, they're actually upstairs in the same beautiful area, in the same beautiful mosque that the men are in. It's not like that all over the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And it's not like that in America most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. here it really is. Mm -hmm. And like, um, she skateboards and she does photography and she likes to wear oversized hoodies and parachute pants and and vans and like you know what i'm saying <laughs> she's cool she's cool but but it's the but there's nobody being like what how do you identify mm -hmm. and what's your you know what's your you know how you have to identify yourself because and then the way you identify yourself shows which team you're on because you have to be at it you got to take sides yes it's like that whole taking sides thing yes you have to take sides and the side you take is based on how how we can determine your thing mm -hmm. and it's just like man i i know it's one of the things for her that's hard for her when she still talks to her friends back home mm -hmm. because she's like i don't know i don't know I just take pictures and I, I skateboard and mm -hmm. I I wear a hijab and it's not like some like she wears a hijab with a baseball cap over it mm -hmm. or a beanie over it That's or all. like it's you know what I'm saying it's fire yeah like it's and it's her own thing mm -hmm. nobody's looking at her crazy I love it too nobody's taking a second look mm -hmm. nobody's you know what I'm saying she got a big old like K-pop <laughs> hoodie on and a you know what I'm saying yeah nobody's taking a second look at her. And nobody's saying like, where do you, how do you align in the, you know what I mean? And I'm kind of like, man, I don't know that I ever need them to know about that. Mm -hmm. But then also for so long, I was suited up in battle mm -hmm. in America because I felt like I had to be. Yes. From the time I remember myself, from the I like, mm -hmm. I, I, like my first memories are me telling my family members how privileged they were, mm -hmm. and them and them hating me for it. Mm. Like those are some of my first memories, and like I like I tore up a room in my grandmother's house because mm. like some because one of my uncles called me the N word with the hard er, you know mm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I tore up a room in their house, and then uh, like I I wasn't allowed to come on family vacations anymore. Like I've been fighting. Mm -hmm. All's my life, I got stuff. <laughs> I've been fighting. Yes, sir. And the idea of not raising my children mm -hmm. to fight in those frameworks, mm -hmm. there's times where I'm like, man, if I heard myself say this two, th three years ago before I moved here, mm -hmm. I would be like, oh, this is just, you're just opting out. Mm -hmm. You're, 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 you're abandoning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? That's 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 something that's something that will waft through my mind from time to time, and I don't know what to do about it. My, if we're talking like for me, like first conversations of race, I think was for me anywhere that I can remember, mm -hmm. probably five years old, mm -hmm. like same age as, you know, one of the babies. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because that's really when you think about it. That's that's still to me, even family members that are 11, 12 in comparison, I'm like, these are babies and not just in the form of stature and, you right. know, but in the sense of like mind experiences, yeah, all of that yeah. from the, from the best of the best to the worst of the worst, you know, just life experiences, just mindset, even the way that they move, the, the jovialness, the happiness, that's right. like, it's ba it's like pure baby stuff. It's not ill intended, ill intended. It's not, you know, there's no malintentions. Yeah. It, there's a, a beauty to that. You know, it's like it's like coming into the room, you buy these shoes, you think they're fly, and, and you're just enjoying these shoes because you like them. This is what you wanted. Right. You step into the room and then you're just getting picked apart. Yeah. At a, especially when and it all I think happens to us, especially in certain spaces at a very young age. Yeah. And we just love this. Like, oh, I love this jacket. Oh, I love this shirt. Yeah. And then somebody comes in the room or many people could be family right and sometimes it start it starts there a lot of times too mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, or something you love or or a part of a culture that you're you know i love this music these are my friends and someone says some disparaging comments to you right an uncle and yeah. you destroy part of the house you feel me yeah and it's and somebody takes that away from you Dude, that's that's a violation 
Yeah. That's a huge violation mm -hmm. on humanity. Yeah. The purest part of the fact it is, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. It's like, why is it that when we're children, we're like some of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And then once you've had certain experiences, we either lose that or it's taken from us. Yeah. So we navigate the world with this chip on our shoulder. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody looks at me too long, they're getting the business. They cut me off in traffic. Yeah. They're getting the business. Yeah. They say they even crack a joke that makes no sense to me. I'm going off on them. Right. And we li and, and then we're walking around the world with all of this unresolved stuff too that we haven't even tried to work on. Mm -hmm. And think of how many people have had all of those experiences and haven't talked about them. Yeah. Haven't worked through them. Yeah. Then we have children. Yeah. They have children. Yeah. And it just continues. Yeah. And it started from this one piece of other people yeah. who had unresolved stuff. And then there's that flip side to it all. Like, man, if I don't say anything to my children or to my family that may be the similar age, like, yo, it's the, it's a bat, it's a, it's a strange battle. Yeah. Like, do I want to take that away from them? That their world of, I can just read books with the uncles. Yeah. I'm learning, you know, Arabic and the Quran. Yeah. And we just, you know, we laugh, we joke, we, you know, yeah, all I mean, of that's that. their whole world. Yes. Their biggest problem, the biggest problem that they even know about. And I mean, and I can imagine it being this way for a very long time. Like I, I could imagine that they could live their whole lives and never know that these things. Now, they're, they, like you said, the fact that, that their, their whole family have, like we've all been fighting in this thing for hundreds of years. Yes. So there's a chance that it'll be in them in some kind of way. Yes. You know what I mean? But as of like as of right now, yes. So I'd be, I'd be asking them, you know what I mean? And you've heard you've heard the mm -hmm. the rundown. What's yes. your name? How do you spell it? How old are you? Who's your mom? Because I want them to be able to, if they get lost or something, to be able to explain the mm -hmm. basic pedigree stuff. Yes, sir. So I'd be like, where do you live? And they'll say, Uskudar, Istanbul, Turkey. Mm -hmm. Oh, you live in Turkey? Are you Turkish? I'm black and Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. To them, I want them. That's always just something dope for them to know about themselves. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I I don't want that to ever have to be like. Okay, well, you know, you take somebody like Fat Joe, mm -hmm. and they're like, some some people are roasting Fat Joe for using the N word, mm -hmm. but they don't realize, well, like in New York, what it means to be Puerto Rican in, in the Bronx. Yes, they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you just take, you just project his image and his way of living mm -hmm. to another place, yes. and and suddenly he's viewed a completely different way, mm -hmm. or you know. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I'm just like, man, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I kind of don't want them to know mm -hmm. that somebody, that somebody thinks they're not human. Yeah. That's, or that somebody thinks there's something wrong with them being who they are. Yes. Yes. That's, and again, I've seen that. Or, or again, you have to pick a side. Yeah. Like, why can't, <laughs> but then also, sorry, but like, <laughs> no, also, no. I remember at one point, Sandy Newton was like, I don't identify as black. I, th I think it was her, right? Was she the one that said that? I've I've heard it from me, like, Raven, Raven Simone's of the world. I mean, a lot of people have just been like, I just want to identify, and then they just get yeah torched. It's just like, <laughs> and yeah. I've probably been on the side with some fire too. Like Man, what? Yeah, I, yeah. what? <laughs> but I I feel like maybe Thandie Newton or something like that, mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that she, I can't remember exactly, what, and maybe it's not even her. But I remember there was an actress mm -hmm. who, you know is of African descent mm -hmm. in America. And she's like, I don't identify as black. Mm -hmm. And she's like, because, you know, my parents are from here and, and I just didn't grow up with this framework. Mm -hmm. This isn't my framework. Mm -hmm. So she's like, I'm in America. Um, I see other descendants of Africans as like connected to me in some kind of way. But this framework of black is not one that I grew up mm -hmm. identifying with. Yes. And yeah, like you said, me and you might have <laughs> had a nice, fun night on, <laughs> on the road. You know what I'm saying? Being like, you know, te tearing that apart and being yeah. like, oh, you think. And it's, just, you know, also at this point, she's affluent. She's light skinned. She's yes. successful. And then, but I'm saying, and that's what I'm saying. It's like the both of the complexities of it all. Mm -hmm. Both of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why, like, it's the fact that the the world that's been constructed is so 
mm-hmm. complicated. Mm-hmm. And there are so many different nuances to it. Yes. That like a person just being, because it's like for me, I'm like, okay, I, I had all these experiences and I'm just telling the truth. And from inside my body, it feels a certain way. But also mm-hmm. it does mean something for somebody else, for, for a black hip hop artist in the Twin Cities that's having a hard time getting the same, mm-hmm. the same opportunities that I'm getting to look at me and be like, no, mm-hmm. you're just white. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And how could you ever not be clear about that? Mm. How could that? What do you mean that's that's confusing to you? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like I understand somebody feeling that way too. Yes. You know. Um, it's just one of those things. It's like, man, what what is clear to me is that it's not a, it's still not avoidable. Mm-hmm. It's still not avoidable. Yeah. It's it is still present. Yes. Yes. And to me true like if if and even just the word of 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 when i hear sometimes even kind of i guess it would be a side note when people say equality or or we things could could, could and should be equal or, it, or whatever but it's like even in within that mm-hmm. you have to give up something like you can't and and i mean that and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean like you have to share to yeah. me like you really have to share you know, it's like, oh, if we all want to walk, let's say if we all want to walk down this road together, yeah, you're going to bump into some people. Right. It's not going to be this 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 always free-flowing thing. There's going to be taxis all up and down the alley. You might have to wait for a while to squeeze through. Right. It's not just going to be like, again, words. You don't own it. This isn't your street. Ain't that crazy? Like you should never, you should never assume mm-hmm. that you will have convenience and mm-hmm. ease and yes. that you'll always be prioritized mm-hmm. like you're gonna you're gonna have to yield to others yes yes but that's such a that's such a wild idea to to people that are so used to being like well everybody gets out of the way for me the true essence from a person of how they really feel or how they really been thinking is, is going to come out at some point it's not always initially, but it might come out at some point of they're like, oh, everything's cool. Right. It's all good. Yeah. But the minute, you know, you get a little comfortable and you really are showing up who you are, yeah. a comic is made or something is said. Or you might have a really close friend and they come out out of their mind. It's like, whoa. Just the what? way they frame things, man. Yes. Yeah. You will realize that this whole time, all the thing, all the friendly things they've been doing in their mind you owe them something for mm-hmm. for what they've been doing. Mm-hmm. They just been making deposits in an account <laughs> of like this is this is what you owe me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's hard because that's in your con- again. If you're operating from that mindset of that framework of 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 then feeling like you're not good enough mm-hmm. when your humanity is continuously called into question, right. like what that does to a person, yeah. especially when it is. You see a sweet five, six, seven, eight year old, or, or fifteen year old, or even someone in their twenties, and just how that that kind of stuff changes people, yeah. And how it just takes from who, like, it's always the potential or the infinite possibilities of what a person could be or what they what we what they could have been. And it's mm-hmm. like when you start diluting or 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 alternating those things. Mm-hmm. You know, I think about all of my experiences, uh, just even with with private school constantly being corrected having my neighborhood friends and then you could you mess around get it on on two or three different sides yeah it's like you go to school people make fun of you for not talking proper Uh then you come back to the crib but then even when you're at school you don't know that you're picking up some of these acclimate you're not that you've acclimated (laughs) in some degree so i never forget a friend of mine (laughs) katie was like man why are you talking all white and shh? You know what I mean? And in my mind, I'm not even hearing it that way. And, and that's just from going to a different school for yeah. a year, but they they could hear some of the differences. Yes. And it was wild to me. And I and I and I kind of tensed up and said, oh man, like, am I losing my cool? You start thinking that you don't even, you don't you again, belonging. Like, dang, am I losing my my sense of belonging with so then you fight almost extra hard, and that's work. You fight you start extra, overcorrecting in, in on both sides. Yeah, you know it's like, let me try to figure out a way. I got to survive here. Let me keep my grades, and, and then your level of what happiness is, that starts coming into play. I started seeing that as an. It's like okay, 
as long as my grades are good, I'm staying out of trouble. And in my mind, you get programmed in a sense to think, okay, this is, everything's good. Yeah. Everything is good in life. But really you're like, if as long as that is cool, yeah. there's no turmoil at the crib. There's no this, there's no that. But deep down inside, yeah. you're still going to this place, mm -hmm. this school, this job site, that people are still watching you. The microscope is still, is still on you. And you're still just like dying inside almost because you still don't feel like you're bringing 100% of who you are to a situation. Mm -hmm. it, it and self hatred like on a on on a and people might not even see it as that they just right. think of it as yeah man you know like I'm just I gotta I, let me just ease up a little maybe I am too then you start questioning maybe I am I too much maybe I should you know what let me take the hijab off let me make you feel calm you know what let me stop skating let yeah. me stop taking pictures yeah let me stop listening to the music yeah let me change my group of friends or whoever else I'm spending time with. Let me distance myself from my family. Let me just be, a, let me straighten my hair out. Mm -hmm. You start doing all, I mean, you really start, and that can start as young as the age of, of what the babies are. Yeah. And people come up with that. Yeah. And then you get it from the other side yeah. in so many different ways. From the very beginning of this podcast, we've been talking about mental health and specifically about therapy. And if you listen to an episode I did with Dr. Ebony, who is a therapist from Texas, we talk through all of the misconceptions that people get from TV, movies, and social media about what therapy is, about these diagnoses, these conditions, you know, what is and what isn't therapeutic, and what does it really mean to get serious about our own mental health and just give ourselves the opportunity to explore ourselves, to take some time and sit with the things that have transpired in our lives and the meaning that we've made around those, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and about the world and having the opportunity to clear those cobwebs and to talk through this stuff with people that are just there to serve us and people that are trained and have experience and part of a community, part of a network, part of a, a, a system of accountability and uh, growth that can really just serve us in that way. So a lot of things are therapeutic, but therapy is therapy. And I believe in it along with all these other things that we talk about in the podcast. I think it's really important. The way that I access therapy as a person that lives outside of America and I don't have a job, I'm self-employed, you know, better help is something that I heard about on podcasts. And you probably have too, because they advertise a lot on podcasts. Uh, BetterHelp is an online therapy platform. It's a network of thousands of trained, licensed professionals that do this for a living. And there's all sorts of different approaches to mental health and to therapy. And they have people that specialize in all of these different areas. Uh, so BetterHelp is really dope. You go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash travelers, and they'll take you to their questionnaire. You fill that out and it's gonna walk you through step-by-step. Step. What is it that's bringing you to therapy? What are the things that you think you might wanna talk about? What kind of therapist do you wanna to talk to? And how would you feel comfortable connecting with them? And then you jump in immediately with them. When you use our link, you're gonna get a discount and we're gonna get uh, a commission for connecting you. And it's something that a lot of people have done that listen to this podcast. And it's tremendously helpful. You can change therapists at any time. You can stop at any time. You can you know, cancel your subscription if you want to. You're not locked in. But this is something that I am very grateful. It's a partnership I'm really grateful to have because it's something that I really believe in. So go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, fill out that questionnaire. You start communicating with your therapist within 24 hours, texting them, messaging them. You set up your own 
times that you meet with them. You decide if you want to talk on the phone, if you just want to send messages for the time being, if you want to be able to see them, you know, on the screen. And I just can't recommend it enough. It's been profoundly healing and beneficial for me. So I'm grateful to share with you betterhelp.com. I've seen you, you know, carry that thing that you're talking about from private school, being one of the very well-known, respected, you know, established hip hop artists in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. It just seems like such a continuation of that whole challenge. Yeah. At times, you know, at times, at at times it, it definitely, it has been, um, and you think again, um, is this really about yeah, that was that was a hard time, especially when things were kind of like getting started and you know, the sound sets and the festivals and and just wanting to the the initial thing for me, like for my goal, all especially in the beginning for rap, is like I just want to rap really good, you know. Right. And like how does the community really like show up or what is what is that what is that what does that word really mean and and how do people really feel about like is this a genuine mm-hmm. like I've had to question that sometimes mm-hmm. you know those have been questions on me it's like what 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 is this so but the people that have genuinely just shown love and my experiences with a lot of people haven't been the same as other people it was never a situation of the only way I would ever like call somebody out or or anything is if they actually did something to me, mm-hmm. not of what they didn't do for me. Right. You know, right. I, I, like I I'm, I don't operate from that place. And if they and if it was if there was some static or an issue, and we've got and when I consider you to be a friend, mm-hmm. I'm gonna call you, or I'm gonna text, right. or I'm gonna check in and and, t- and temperature check. Right. I'm not gonna randomly blast you online yeah. and and say all of these things because it it quote unquote di- wasn't or di- isn't working out for me or didn't work out I'm I'm not going to do that right and then turn around on the flip and be like but yo can you put me on a roll with you right can I go to the spot and rock the open mic or can I do it's like that's low key abusive like oh so you want to d- trash me dump on me yeah. and then turn around and still be like but hey Unless you got something from me. Yes. Yeah. And I'm saying and that that also is part of that that transaction. Mm-hmm. Like we have transactions instead of love. Yes. But those transactions are a person seeking what they don't realize they actually want, which is love. Yes. Like I want love. Yes. I don't know what that is. I don't have a language for that. I don't have any understanding of that. I don't think that I may, you know, it doesn't seem realistic. Yes. But what I could get instead Yes. You know, that might, you know, so if I can get money, if I can get power, if I can get influence, if I can get attention, if I can get fame, if I can get affluence, if I can get the ability to make some decisions about some power, you know what I mean? Then, because I have those things and people want them, yes. then people may uh, interact with me in a way that's close enough to love that mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take that. And I'll be good. You know, I'll be able to to move around in the spaces I think I want to move around in. Right. And a lot of people don't necessarily know, yeah. do you really want these things? Do you re- even just, I've only been, and I'm going to keep it a thousand, I've only been on two national tours and, and both of those have been with you. Mm-hmm. I've done some regional stuff here and there um, with Atmosphere and, and some other folks in the Midwest. But some people, it's like, do you, re- do you really know if this is what you want to do until you've really experienced those things? And I don't know if a lot of people really know yeah. if they want to do some of these things. Because the image or what, like what you imagine it being is not what it is. It's work. It's work. It can work if you put the time and the hustle in. And, and that's why I think for me where I get, I get passionate, but I also get, you know, uh, uh, upset. And maybe I am biased towards... A, a, a few of you guys, man, is because like the opportunities. Excuse me. Um, there's a lot of people who haven't given those opportunities. Mm-hmm. And it's like. I'm in a place or just I've thought and I've had a mindset where it's like 
I would love to be in a similar position in a sense of, so even though I can't take a bunch of people on tour, I've always tried to open my door mm -hmm. or keep an open door. Mm -hmm. So if people have questions mm -hmm. or if they need to talk or vent or just somebody to like chop it up with, yeah, that's man, like not even just being dope, but just really wanting to have connection, like a sense of belonging. Right. Like that's what hip hop and rap music was for me. Yeah. Was like that sense of self, that sense of manhood. Some of it not always positive, but there were a lot of positive images. And then there was some stuff that was like, okay, I'm grown up, you know, but it's it shaped me. Mm -hmm. Like those are the things that I came up wanting. And then when you have experiences that may not um the bubble can get bursted in, yeah. in your thought process. You change. Yeah. You move a little different around people. Yeah. Um, and it's it's wild because of certain elements of you went to this school. Oh man, like I don't know. Like you're not a you 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 know, you privileged or it's like, dude, I'm putting in work too. Right. I wrote these songs by myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I paid for these albums and not to like stunt, but it's like I'm I'm investing in myself. Right. The way and I was and I'm like, I'm watching you guys, like the the guys from the label, the RSCs, the everyone who had a, a sit it's like I'm watching. Like I'm just I'm just trying to watch. If I have questions, I'm asking. I'm just mm -hmm. reaching out. I'm mm -hmm. never too shy to ask if I really have a question. So it's like I just want to present something that other people can feel like that there this is possible. Yeah. And you you start then start hearing inklings and, and that stuff hurts. Yeah. And and like that's a hard thing because then you're in space with people. Mm -hmm. And then when you see people, yeah, you feel there's yeah. a tension that's still there. Even if you're like, oh man, you know what's every but you know deep down in your heart, it's like, nah, something's not right. Yeah. And it it and it it causes you to like change and back up and change how you move around people. You trust people less. You don't know. Mm -hmm. who's 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 really loves me or who like just sees me as like oh it's another artist from the town and just just in the name of being a black artist hip-hop artist there's all this other stuff that comes with oh you got something right and it's like pfft, and i'm just i'm working right or trying to trying to work or, yeah you know like this isn't i'm working <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's like I just want to be a good human. I just want to go, like move in the world and, and make everyone else happy or whatever that is. Yeah. And that gets popped. Yeah. You're too loud, you're too dark, too skinny, too big, too this. Yeah. Too light. Don't know where to put you. And on the other side, you're like, oh, you're the you're you're the black artist that white people are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So you're getting all these, you're getting opportunities that other people don't get because you are comfortable. And this music thing, as we've talked about many a times, is deep. It's it's so much. It's like it's it's like having this having songs, and not just having the songs that a specific group of people is gonna like, but just having songs that just connected with somebody. Somebody, yes, and yeah, and that's and that's the thing that I'm always like, okay, for for any for all of the the the, the conversation of artists that look at other artists and like, well, why do you have something that I don't have, mm -hmm. and like where are the songs that connect with people and it, even because even if that's a small number of people like where are the people that you don't know mm -hmm. that don't have any dog in the fight that just you create some piece of art mm -hmm. that speaks to them so much yes that they put their time into it they'll spend their time with it and they'll spend their money being around it and they'll 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 give something that they have because what they get from that a song, that mm -hmm. show, that experience, that video, that mm -hmm. shirt, whatever, what they get is so valuable mm -hmm. that like, I'll do whatever I need, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why we used to say dope. Yeah. Cause the idea like, you see what do dope fiends do for dope? <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Because they need that feeling so bad. And so like when music or art like does something on that level for somebody that they're mm -hmm. willing to give it, that's really what determines whether or not there can be some success. Yes, sir. And like, that's not something that, that's not transferable. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody, Slug didn't give it to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't give it to you. Yes. You know what I mean? So, and that's, and that happens on so many different levels. Cause like, you know, at some point Slug had to learn how to freestyle. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. At some point, Slug had to learn how to write songs mm -hmm. uh, that actually connect with other people. At some point, Slug had to figure out how to perform live. Mm. You know what I mean? And I can take inspiration from those things, but he can't, he can't give them to me. Mm -hmm. Then I have to, once I realize those are the things, then like I have to learn how to do those things. Mm -hmm. And like the audience is going to determine whether or not that is. And like, I, I mean, I, I've, I've said before that like, I brought a bunch of people on tour. I don't know how many times I can, I, I can, it's like you and two other people mm -hmm. that when they get done with their set and it's brother Ali time, the crowd is like, wait a minute, Mali, <laughs> Mali. It's you, Saw Rock, and Evidence. Mm. Good company to be in. Thank and, you. And Evidence had it to a certain degree already, mm -hmm. but not with these people. Yes. Like Evidence still had to go out there and show them, mm. like almost act out for them. This is why. Mm. Uh, an alchemist beat that's like way slower than the ant beats you guys are listening to. Mm. And this is why a premiere beat mm. is dope. And this is why, like he had to physically act it out for people. Man. You know what I'm saying? Man. And then Cy Rock to be a black woman backed by a black man. Yes. First of all, that's illegal. Beautiful though. Yeah. Beautiful. And like step out and show and, 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 be burning sage and talking about, you know what I'm saying? All the things that she's talking about. Right. To like, to, but to be able to have, to be able to offer the feeling that people offer, it's like, that's such a, that's such a, uh, a miracle to be able to do it. Yes. And that's the thing that's always like, I wish it, I wish it was possible to, to give people that kind of empowerment, to give artists that feel like, well, why do they have something I don't have? Mm -hmm. And like, man, if you can bring it back to that, because there may be truth in those other things. Mm -hmm. There may be truth there, even in the critiques. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, yeah, you, like, okay, you grew up in, um, in these private schools. Mm -hmm. So like there, there's probably truth to the ability that you're able to navigate white spaces. Mm -hmm. You have some tools for that. And then you were in, the, in corporate. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, it's probably true that you have, but that doesn't mean, but still you had to and continue to have to go into yourself and make songs that make people be like, damn, I don't know what it is about that song, but when he's spitting that way, mm -hmm. my body and my stomach remember when I felt something and like, I'm, I'm having an experience. Something is, is opening up inside me because of what he's doing. And then when he gets on stage and does it, mm -hmm. I feel a thing mm. that I wasn't expecting to feel. Mm. And I can't feel it unless Mally's here. Mm. To the point where, like, I bought my ticket to see Brother Ali, mm. but I don't really want Mally to leave. That's a, that's, mm. like, I can't give you that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And whatever tricks you know about how to talk to white people, that's, that's not that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That might make it so that like my tour manager or whatever, like you know how to na you know how to talk to my tour manager. <laughs> but if you had the ability to make a room full of people do that and you didn't know how to talk to my tour manager, I would tell my tour manager, "Hey, you got to figure it out cuz the people mm. he's powerful on the stage." Mm. You're I the tour manager would have to figure out how to do it with you. Mm. Cuz you see they do it with <laughs> Tyler the creator or Sean Price or mm. whoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like they'll figure out, they, yeah. they will figure out how to go to you. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, uh, and, and man, for one, thank you. And I don't think I've ever just even had the moment to just even publicly thank a lot of people that have just invested the time, even if it was just a conversation, mm -hmm. even if it was just someone, uh, you know, recommended me to a sound engineer mm. carnage for instance recommended me to a sound engineer yeah. bob Lindbergh, good friend mm. of mine mm. if he didn't do that he yeah you know what i mean like him des getting me in the classroom slug taking phone calls when i'm at work yeah hey man like you know navigate he called me one time he called me to go on tour and there was some other times where he was talking to me like how do i navigate this mm -hmm. i'm having a hard time Wearing the t-shirt on stage. That was the big thing. You taking me on tour, being friends, having me over to the house, freestyling, all of that. Like all of those things. And I'm like, in my mind, like, but I'm working. And then in my mind, I'm like, 
But I'm also from South. Then you start once again. You start questioning these things. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, but I'm from South Minneapolis. Right. Yo, my family's from the South. Right. I was raised this way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like education was considered important. So in all of the things that when people question that stuff, Mm -hmm. what my intentions are, for me, like all of that time and those investments in self and and who I am and even just deciding to be sober and like intentionally deciding to be sober. Like that's not just a for me a selfish move like i'm 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 a re, i'm a i'm a reflection of the investment that my mom put into me right. that my grandma put into me my uncles like all the time you know like my family like even my baby cousins like all of the inspir- like all of that stuff like is a reflection of the investment that everyone put into me mm-hmm. the little stuff which is really big stuff yourself i mean man dude like so when people have tried to like come for me like that that stuff hurts like yeah. and, and and then and and the the work that i put in and i pass that on to the other homies who may have not had certain opportunities that right, i've had right, that's right. why i would say man my door is always open that's why i'm always talking to one of my good 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 great friends in music prism great guy i'm always just like firing off at the text mm-hmm. just giving just trying to share yeah. with the other homies like yeah. man like, think about this. Think about the artwork. Think about, like, just that stuff is important. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, just put your all into it. Like, pre- the presentation, like, do that. So when people have tried to, like, dump on y'all, like, I'm, I try to check in. Like, yo, everything good? Right. Like, how y'all been? Right. I, I, and, I, and the reason why I publicly, if I'm being a thousand, why I didn't publicly say certain things a few years ago when a lot of stuff was popping off uh, is because it's like I'm still, like, thinking about, Who's gonna like? Oh, you're just right. you're a deal. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you're riding. You know, like yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm like all, oh, but when people do, it's like that's the I take that personal. Yeah, I just do, and it and it feels like it's again like the other side of a lot of the the belonging piece that we're talking about. Everybody is coming into this situation looking for love. Mm-hmm. Like the whole conversation we're talking about, the way it relates to the whole first part of what we were talking about yeah what it's like to be in istanbul Mm -hmm. you know that like people are coming into music thinking i'm music is going to i'm going to get love because of this music that i'm doing it's like on the one hand it's not always like that you know what i mean (laughs) but also everybody but i thought that too Mm -hmm. like i really thought that like if i do all this community stuff then the community will do something for me. Mm-hmm. And I learned I learned not to think mm-hmm. that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> where's the part where somebody's like, "Wait, we don't we're not talking about Ali, right?" Nobody said that. Mm-hmm. Nobody was like, "Wait, you're not talking about Ali." Or even, you know, but you know, people are holding cards. They just I, and that's and that's a slight piece of my paranoia or maybe just a yeah. just like it's like what well, if I ever if I ever need to take go at this person this is how i would do it you know what i mean and it ends up not even being about what are we what is this really about yeah what is it really about and you're getting more but so people going into this thing going coming into it in general like i want to somehow use this thing to get the love that i'm supposed to have as a human being mm-hmm. the acknowledgement or just you know the, I, i'm supposed to maybe if i'm famous mm. then i can just be mm mm-hmm. Maybe if I have money, then I could, then I won't be attacked or mm-hmm. assaulted or like my humanity won't be denied. Mm-hmm. Even the rich, famous people that I know, I know some very rich, very famous, very sexy, very like <laughs> everybody thinks they want to be them. Mm-hmm. Those people feel the least loved in a lot of ways. Wow. And like they feel like, well, yeah, I've got to get $50 million every two years so that I can have an entourage around me so that I can constantly prove to people how valuable, how worthy I am of love. Look at all the good things I do. Look at all of the good, look at all the good that I give all these people. Mm. Like that's, they're still also really always trying to prove that they're human and. Mm. So for me, I'm like, okay. (laughs) So for me, I'm like, well, what do you do about all this? Mm -hmm. Islam. Mm. 
Mm. And I don't mean the kufi and the hijab and the and the sharia and the but like the the transformative power mm-hmm. of Islam mm-hmm. of, of of first of all just having giving ourselves permission to say I can radically reimagine everything mm. based on something that's that comes from the first truth of it all. Mm. Which is deeper than do I change my name and do I grow a beard and mm. is it okay to have a dog and is it okay to drink and is it okay to have tattoos and is it okay to mm. Mm. have a girlfriend or a boyfriend? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like all that stuff probably has a place. But really the 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 underlying truth there. Mm. Like I can't tell somebody what it's like to like, okay, I come into this religion and everything about my life is being turned upside down. Mm. And like a 70 year old black man who saw his relatives lynched Mm. and then at one point believes that the white man is the devil and at some other point now treats me Mm. like his son. Mm. 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 And then it's like, mm. to the point where like he had every right to say whatever he said and believe whatever he believed. Mm. And then taught me how to worship God and wash my body. And, it, and we both know that when he dies, I'm going to wash his body. I'm the one that's going to put him in the ground. Mm. Mm. Like for some people be like, well, yeah, you're a little religion or whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But that stuff does something to you, man. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, it gets to that whole thing about like, okay, we can talk about whatever legislation and and policy, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to uh, to downplay that or to minimize it or to devalue uh, it. Mm-hmm. But it's like, we still got to get to like, why do people want to kill every, why do we want to kill each other? Why do we want to? Mm -hmm. And where's the part where people actually, what's the process of rehumanizing? Wow. How's that happen? Because that's not something Congress can do. No. (laughs) Yeah. As they say, like, it's it's deeper than certain things. It's, It's way beyond that. It's way beyond that. And that the piece you spoke about, the the love piece mm-hmm. of someone who you said could just have, like, I felt that. Yeah, Howard Tawab. Howard Tawab went to prison. His, I'm saying his family members were lynched. Mm. Nick Muhammad's father-in-law. Mm. That was another guy. But mm-hmm. they, they, they're from that same generation. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, our, our brother Musa Weir. I was with Musa Weir every day. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Same thing. He's from there from St. Louis. I mean that that guy got in a shootout in a courtroom. <laughs> oh, wow. In the in the 60s and 70s with the Nation of Islam. And I'm saying every day, like I ate with him, and you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And I was out of town when he died. I didn't get to wash him, but we had every anticipation that I would probably wash. And and it and if I died, he would wash me. Mm. You know what I mean with our bare hands and that we would like, we would hold each other's bodies and put each other's bodies in the ground. Mm. And it's like, Hey, you're, I'll be right next to you someday. I don't know when, Mm. but someday I'll be next to you. And then all this stuff is going to die and it's just going to be us. And and I'm saying, and we said stuff to like, I, I, you know, we said stuff to each other. There's times where Mm -hmm. the differences in our backgrounds would bump into each other and whatever else. Yes, sir. But it's like, we always knew that at the end of the day, I would die. F- I would die. We would die for each other, mm. because we're living like the thing that we really know we're living for. Like, is is the same. Like that's a. It's the universal mm. source of it all. Mm. Mm. And that's what this feels like to be in here yeah. again. It's like the perfect, the imperfect, how do say the imperfect perfection of the perfect imperfections, how everything is, it may not look, folks are bumping into each other. Yeah. There's not a smooth 
yeah. flow as we think it should be or what we're used still to. People smoke cigarettes. Like, yeah, oh heavy. God. Yeah, we just like to <laughs> come on. Yeah, it's not perfect. There's not a. This is not a romantic, rosy lens. Right, right, right. Everything there. You know, the streets are paved in gold, and everybody just, just hugs everyone. <laughs> just want to make art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, put them up. Put them up. <laughs> but it's like, damn it, man. People are human here with all the stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. What's the thing we, uh, we've we kind of said? Like both things can be true. Why can't both things be man. true? Oh, man. That's my <laughs> wife all day. I love that. Why can't both things be true? Because it's, it, it's the fact, like, why can't we have conversation? Yeah. Why can't we disagree verbally? Or why can't we maybe see a, you know, like, yeah. and, and on some things, it's like, <sighs> but... And, and sometimes you're just gonna be wrong. Sometimes yes. you are going to be wrong. Yes, and that's okay. And it's but it's because it's part of again. It's like what is a human being? Right. A human being is wrong. Right. right. That's one of the things we are. Right. So right. like the fact that I'm wrong doesn't mean oh see I shouldn't have existed. Right. I deserve to die. Right. I de it's like no, you're supposed to be wrong. Right. And and when you're wrong, I'm, gonna be, I'm you're gonna I'm gonna be mad at you. Right. And you're gonna have to get back in my good graces, right. and, you know what I mean. And I'm gonna have to check my own self too. Yes. Even in your wrongness, I'm gonna have to check myself. Yes. And we don't do that. Everyone's just carrying this. Yeah. They're, they're just carrying these things. There, there's, there needs to be. Uh, and when I say hard reset, I'm not saying blow it all up and put it back together in the literal sense, but I mean just there does need to be some sort of reset of yeah. as rehumanizing. Yeah. Hard reset. In America, we expect people to believe what we believe. And if you don't believe what I believe and you don't affirm it, it's like you can't hold a differing worldview without being my enemy. And that's not the way that I see it. I don't need people to see it this way. I don't yeah. require people to agree to, you know, to. But I've seen Islam be that hard reset over and over again. Um, but man, you know, we've been, it, it would be very easy for us to do this for another like three hours and we've done it over and over again. <laughs> and at the beginning of this podcast, like about a year ago, I was saying all the time, like, man, if my voice is rough at the shows, it's because I'm supposed to be quiet, but I'm on tour with Mally. <laughs> and you, you were listening to the podcast, like, man, stop blaming me. <laughs> but I, I think now people like, like, I don't know how to stress to people that are listening that like, this is this is light for like, yeah, <laughs> for like the conversations that we usually have this is easy. for months at a time. Mm -hmm. Like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there anything you want to make sure to, you know, cause at some point we got to call it an episode. Is there anything you want to make sure to, to say or to include while we're here? Yeah. Just, uh, thank you for, you know, I think being a, uh, first and foremost, just a a, a, a a true friend, you know, family in this, 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 this space of, of just not only just music, but like just on, on a life tip, like on, like it's, it's interesting because if in some cases it's like, uh, for some people it's the, 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 the art comes and then, but for me, it's like, even though the, 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 the music stuff kind of like showed up first and then we became close. But to me, the way it feels is almost as if like we friends and we, and we're close. Music is like, even if music wasn't mm -hmm. a thing or mm -hmm. wasn't the thing that connected us to work together on certain levels, mm -hmm. we'd still connect and catch up and break bread and check in like, Oh, how the baby's doing or, you know, how your nieces or, you know, yeah. how, like how's mom or how's grandma doing or, you know, you know, you can't make these things up. Like this is a gift, yeah. you know, and a gift that is again, bigger than, than us, uh, bigger than any of my biggest dreams. Like just being able to just be alive, like taking none of it for granted. Like this moment, this time, this conversation, this space, um, I'm grateful for it all. So thank you. Man, thank you. It's so, it's such a like, um, each relationship teaches you different things mm. and like they become like symbols for different things. And um, one of the main things that, that this, like our bond, like our brotherhood and our, mm. what you know, yes, sir. it's really proven to me and made it so real to me 
how much every interaction or every engagement or every relationship is mutual. Mm. Like nothing's Mm -hmm. one-sided. It's just so clear to me because I get so much from it. Mm. Like how mutual this thing is for us. You know what I mean? So for like you being on tour and being like, like going on tour, you know, somebody might be like, oh, you know, uh, headlining artists gave support artists the opportunity to, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But for me, being in the in the one situ- in the one role, it really shows me how mutual it is. Mm-hmm. If it when it when it's really good, when it's really not, when it's mm-hmm. really you know, mm-hmm. because I know how much I, I how much it benefits me. Mm-hmm. Like all these conversations, well, the way that you're saying them, like we're reflections of each other, mm-hmm. and I know how different it is. Mm-hmm. You know how much it means for me to when you're on stage for me to know like man i can learn from this i believe in this Mm. i feel good about this he doesn't have to say what i say Mm -hmm. you know what i mean or he Mm -hmm. can say things that i don't say that's not even the point Mm -hmm. like i believe in what's happening on stage i learn from it Mm -hmm. i'm energized by it i'm Mm -hmm. fed by it and then all of this this stuff off stage you know what i mean the the i think i mentioned on this podcast that like you've taught me a lot by the questions you ask Mm. And the fact that you teach by asking questions, mm-hmm. I'm so literal and overbearing, and like that's my, you know, you already know that, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's my, that's my way, you know what I mean? Like, but you, you teach by asking questions. I remember one time you asked me one time because you know my wife and like you know my kids and you like you know us, mm-hmm. like you not it's not you just been around us, like you have a genuine sense of who we are. <laughs> and I'm sitting there complaining, not complaining, but I'm I'm sitting there, you know, just talking about challenges and the. And you said, do you think your wife has space to, and you didn't have to finish the question. I was just like, no, <laughs> it just shifted my whole, you mm. know what I mean? Mm. And then even being here, like I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about my first time coming to Istanbul mm-hmm. and like the way that it felt to me and the way, like seeing all this stuff, you know, and I'm like, man, it's dope to be able to, to kind of facilitate that for somebody else. Mm-hmm. But then also like for me, what it means to like go through all the stuff li- of living here, mm-hmm. you know, and this being such, you know, it's not a destination, especially for a person who's not a Muslim, mm-hmm. to just be like, I want to go to Istanbul. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, most people want to go to Paris or Rome or something, mm-hmm. or, or or even, um, you know, Liberia or Ghana. It's it's not on the, you know, unless you're Muslim, this is not one of the main places. Mm-hmm. But for for somebody from home who knows me and my family as well as you do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. To come here and, like I said, just seeing this reflected in you Mm -hmm. is like, man, it's it's really, um, it's a really huge part of the of the process of of healing and and wholeness Mm -hmm. that we're seeking here. Mm -hmm. That like I like you being here makes me realize like, oh, I can't do this by myself. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I need the I need the reference point of somebody who knew me mm. at home mm-hmm. to come and be like, oh, this is what this is. Like I like your validation mm. is really important. And it, and also being able to really measure it. Mm. Like just seeing how I feel. Mm-hmm. And also the growth I haven't done yet. Because there's times <laughs> where I realize like, oh, I'm back talking like I used to talk. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So part of it is I'm just removed from <laughs> like it's not like I've totally just because I don't engage in all the same stuff I used to engage in. Yeah. It's like oh, that's because I haven't had the opportunity to engage all of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like some of the things I still catch myself doing mm-hmm. because you're here. I'm mm-hmm. like oh, th- there's still a lot of growth left to do. It's a gift. Like this whole thing is all about relationships. Right. This whole yes. thing. Like yeah. This whole thing, not just the music. Yeah. I'm saying all of it is relationship. Yeah. Like what is your relationship to your neighborhood? Uh-huh the people you work with, uh-huh. family members, yourself, yeah. this yeah. whole thing, your relationship with God, the creator, like this whole thing is relationship based. Yeah. Yes. All of it is. Yeah. To the, me. The creation itself. Yes, sir. Allah says, I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known. So I created creation. It's a bar. It's all relations. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, I think we just got to stop by the way. <laughs> and in uh in 20 minutes there's a uh um an alarm that gets set. 
But what's hilarious is I've set this alarm off a million times. It's mm -hmm. like in the building mm -hmm. and the whole neighborhood hears it. <laughs> so I, I, like how many, I don't know, like the first couple of times I did it, I'm like, man, the police are going to come or I'm going to go outside and somebody's going to be like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every time I set the alarm off and I'm just be standing there like, man, I let the gate up. I, I walk outside and I, like nobody even looks out their window. It's just like. It's beautiful. Yeah. Like being able to. Because in, in some other places, if the alarm's going off, you're thinking three or four different things. Oh, yeah. dude, like it's. Yeah, the police might come and shoot me. I'm going through a thing if, if this happens. I might go to jail. I might get kicked out. There's going to be some punitive thing that happens. Man. But just on just the experience, it, it, it's, it's been beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's been beautiful. This, this, this last five days going on six has been, has been beautiful. And I'm definitely, God willing, like planning to come back. You know what I mean? Because I love you, love the family. You know what I mean? Too, and I'm and I'm no words, to be a, to be a thousand. I'm I'm grateful and just thankful that you able to come here yeah. and experience this and live here, raise the babies, uh, teenager, like relationship, be a husband, like all of that, and be a believer all in this to just be. Like, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. So I'm happy for y'all. Yeah, man. All right, let's do it again. <laughs>Much love and special thanks to my dear friend, Mally, for being so generous and gracious with his time. This was a really special episode. And so, you know, you hear in this episode, you just get a taste and an inkling for how we talk and like what our, what our time is like. And just know that we've just got days and weeks and hours and months and years of time hanging out in the tour van, hanging out backstage. Uh, this is why I had to stop rooming with Mally because I would mess my voice up. Like I struggle with my voice. And so when me and Mally room together, it's like, dude, we're going to stay up till six in the morning uh, until it's time for me to do the morning prayer. And then we're going to sleep like two, three hours and go get in the van and go do another show the next night. Can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Had to start getting, getting individual rooms and setting certain times when I just got to put my mask on and get vocal rest. But I'm very, very grateful to be able to share these kind of conversations. And so thanks for, from, to my man, Mally. Go and check out all of his incredible work. Follow him, Mally MPLS, on social media. Uh, he's also ha has a mailing list. All of his projects are up there, his merch. You know, Mally is somebody that I'm just very grateful to be connected with. And I'm happy to show you if you weren't already hip. Amazing artist. Uh, we're sponsored by the Zakat Foundation, Z-A-K-A-T-U-S on social media, and then go to their website, zakat.org, and help out their earthquake relief, help out uh, you know, feeding people, clothing people, giving people goods and resources, housing people that have been you know, displaced, uh, orphan relief. I mean, their, their work is dope. And these are people that I know, it's not some organization where like you're donating and who knows where the money's going and they might actually be doing more harm than good because they're just throwing money into situations. They actually work with people on the ground. They actually deliver what they say they're going to. It's about human dignity first and foremost. They partner with the people that they're helping. It's really dope stuff. So go to Zakat US on social media, zakat.org, put some money on something and know that that money is actually reaching people and is actually benefiting them and impacting their lives and their families, their communities in the world. Very, very, very grateful to them. And I hope when they hear these episodes, I think they do, because they tell us, like they listen and you know, there are people in the organization that, that listen every week and let me know. But it really says something too about them that they understand how a conversation between me and Mali in my neighborhood in Istanbul is related to the work that they do all over the world and the music message and movement. So shout out to them. Shout out to betterhelp.com slash travelers. Go and get down with the therapy journey and head to brotherali.com, sign the mailing list and get down with the 
caravan in the join section. Uh, special shout and thanks to Amna Mirza Mansur Panawala. Everybody that listens to the podcast gives me feedback, all the people that have helped out in a variety of different ways. Traveler's Podcast is produced by Brendan Kelly, aka BK1, and it is a production of Traveler's Media. We love you all. We'll see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.